Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4 that we, we grieve, but we do not grieve as those who have no hope. Jesus said in John chapter 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and that you might have it super abundantly. San Antonio and our entire area has been grieving, has been trying to process the shock of what happened in Uvalde on Tuesday of this past week. A small community that you would think would be safe from big city crimes. But darkness showed up and the enemy sought to steal, kill, and destroy. That can cause the people of the Lord legitimately to ask three questions. I want to briefly, not in a complete form, but in a brief form, to attempt to address these three questions. Number one, where are the children this morning? Nineteen of them, two teachers. Where are they? this morning. Number two, where is justice? Where is justice? And number three, where are you, Lord Jesus, in all of this? Where are the children this morning? Where is justice? And where are you, Lord Jesus? Lord, I ask you to take your word, open it up to us, and unfold your heart, Lord, in a way that we will be able to understand. And leave with a sense of hope and with a sense of healing. In the name of Jesus, the Lord's people said, Amen. Amen. Will you take your copy of the Scripture this morning, your copy of the Bible, and would you find your way to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 18, and we seek an answer for the question, the first question, where are those children this morning? Now, as we read these verses, we understand that there is no way that the sound of words can completely heal at this point in time the depth of a broken-hearted mother, daddy, grandparents, siblings. They are the ones who will live with an empty bedroom and shoes still on the closet floor and toys in the backyard and a bicycle and having to live with the reminder that that one innocent was taken from them. But at some point in time, you may, as a friend or relative of one of those suffering so greatly this morning, you may be given an opportunity by the Lord placing you into their lives and into their hearts to be able to speak, just, just to speak to them, read to them some of these words of Jesus. The initial shock can be too great for us to get our feet underneath us. But as time goes on, the Lord will use the passage of time and the sense of his presence to settle broken hearts, 
and to begin the process of healing. And you may be able to share these verses with ones that you are knowing right now are walking through this. Look at what Jesus says. And again, these are the words of Jesus. This, this is not Isaiah or Moses or Daniel. This is Jesus himself. Verse, chapter 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself. He called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, to cause them to fall or to be ruined, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it is better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and that he be drowned in the depth of the sea. Find chapter 19. Next chapter, Jesus again calls out children. Verse 13, chapter 19, verse 13. Then some children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the children alone, and do not hinder them from coming to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Can I say that one more time? For the kingdom of heaven belongs to to these. So where are the children? Maybe you have a grandchild, or maybe you have a young child still at home, or maybe someone comes up to you, a grown adult, and says, where are those children? Here's your answer. In heaven with Jesus. Jesus himself said, the kingdom of heaven belongs to these. They hadn't grown up and lived long enough to be faced with the choices of right and wrong, evil and good, in a clear sense. We've all had children of our own and grandchildren that in their own right could be ring-tailed tutors, couldn't they? They they had a personality. They had a bent. But evidently Jesus, as he says, the kingdom of heaven belongs to these, is meaning that sin has not so moved into their hearts as to cause them necessarily at, this, at that stage in their lives, at that point in their development, to need to be forgiven for sins. He hadn't died on the cross yet. His blood hadn't been shed. But he says the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. You get low, you get simple, you get gentle, you get humble like these children. And you'll be in heaven just like they will be in heaven. I want you to find the last book in your Bible, please. Book of the Revelation. And Revelation chapter 21. The last book in the Bible is the story of how things end up. 
how when it all comes down, how it is going to come down. And the sense of it is, the focus of it is that Jesus Christ will come again from heaven to this earth. He'll come to Jerusalem. He'll come and be seated on the throne of his father David, as the scripture would say. And from there, he will rule with righteousness and with peace on the earth. It also speaks of what heaven is going to be like. And these words we find in chapter 21 and verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God, is among men. And he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall no longer be any death, there shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. For the first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful, and they are true. Tell those who ask you, the children are in heaven. Well, what's heaven like? It's the place where the Father who was their father before they ever had an earthly father, before they ever had an earthly mother, the father who held them before they were placed in their mother's womb. That father is the one who will cause there to be in the hearts and the lives of everyone who is up there and in specifically, specifically referencing these children who have just gone to be with him There will be no more crying, no more reason to cry. There'll be no more tears, no more reason for tears to fill the eye and to fall. There'll be no more crying, no more mourning, no more tears, no more death. And that he, the Father, will wipe every tear from their eye. Now, there'll come a time... When a mom or a dad or a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt or a a brother or sister are weeping uncontrollably now because of a loss, but the Lord has a way in His timing of turning those tears into a place of confidence and rest and believing that the child that I have lost is in the presence of Jesus. Where are the children? They're with Jesus in that place called heaven that is also called the Father's house. And it will be and is in a sense to them somehow home. It's not earthly home, but somehow that sense that they belong here, they're well here. They're not injured, not wounded, not weak, not afraid, not scared. They're home with Jesus in that place called heaven. Number two, where's justice? Where's justice? I don't know whether this is a human emotion or whether it is a spiritual emotion, but I can just tell you it is real within me. How someone in complete cowardice can go into a school with a loaded rifle and systematically shoot children in classrooms and in their teachers, and then, and then, be shot and killed by law enforcement, finally able to get into the room. And that's it. 
a fit. The, 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 how many stories have we heard of ones who have, who have committed such crimes and then they go off on a corner and stick the gun to their chin and end their lives? But folks, if we're looking for justice in this life, justice in the physical realm, we may never see it. But the reality is, according to this book, according to what God has revealed to us and written in this book, when your heart stops beating and physically you are declared dead, you really aren't dead. Physically, no longer able to see, walk, reach. But I want to show you a passage of Scripture where Jesus tells the story about this rich man and this poor man, and he's having this entire conversation or reporting this conversation after both men have been buried, but still alive still alive, somewhere, that 18-year-old shooter is still alive. Just as much as we believe that those 19 children are still alive, hearts quit beating here, but soul still alive, personality still in place, that the physical body contained a soul. And once the physical body quit working, the soul continues to live. Everybody who has ever lived, every human who has ever lived is alive somewhere. Created, Genesis would say, in the image of God. Well, it's certainly not image in the sense of purity and moral strength and so forth. So what is that, what is that to, to imply to us? We have the capacity for more than what the, our human contemporaries would, would try to lead us into. But beyond all of those things, it has to do with there's a part of you just like there is the reality of God that lives forever. To be created in the image of God, at least in part, means that there is a part of you that will live forever. Hitler still lives. Stalin still lives. Saddam Hussein still lives. This shooter who was taken out by law enforcement, still lives. Let me show you. You'll find in your copy of Scripture, Luke chapter 16, Matthew, Mark, then go to Luke. And Jesus is telling the story. And, and he, would, he would tell stories for the purpose of, of um, specific points that he wanted to make. But as he would make specific large points, there would often be corollary truths that he was also giving information about that we wouldn't have known otherwise. Jesus came from the other side to this side, folks. He didn't start out here and then end up in heaven. He came from heaven. He came from the other side. He came from the spirit realm of realities into this world and became a man. He was God in the fullness of God before he emptied himself and became a man. So when he came to this planet and he, and he lived and walked as a man, he was speaking about the other side from the perspective of, some perspective of somebody who knew what he was talking about, who had been there, who was there, who was a part of the formation of everything that, that was formed. And so from that perspective, he comes to the earth 
and he begins to teach and speak. Now watch what he says. Notice what Jesus says about living after you die. Being able to feel after you die. Being able to communicate after you die. Verse 19. All these words, if you have a red letter edition, are printed in red, meaning every word was spoken by Jesus. Now, there was a certain rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, gaily living in splendor every day. And a certain poor man, Jesus said, named Lazarus, was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table, and besides even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now it came about that the poor man died, and he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, Um, a a symbol of, a picture, another um, descriptive term for heaven, the Father's house carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, or in hell, he, the rich man, lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Now, hold on, just watch how often that word comes up. Lifted his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out, the rich man cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony, in torment, in this flame. But Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you received your good things and Lazarus likewise bad things, but now he is being comforted here And you are in agony, torment, there. And besides all this, between us and you, there was a great chasm fixed in order that those who wish to come over from here to you may not be able, and that those who, those may, none may cross over from there to us. And he said then, I beg you, Father, that you send him, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may warn them lest they should come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. They have the scriptures. They have their Bible. But he said, no, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. They'll change. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. So here's a man, a rich man. He's not, he's not in hell because he's rich. He, that, that's not the unpardonable sin. He's in hell because somewhere along the line he rejected the claims of God upon his life. He, he, he rejected the way of salvation. Jesus would say, Jesus said this to a very religious man, Nicodemus in John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, speaking of Himself, so that whoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Perish from what? From the place called hell. Heaven is one option. Hell is another option. Heaven is a real place. Hell is described in the Scripture as a real place as well. Now realize that that's not a popular topic of polite conversation today. But when we come into a situation where we're longing for there to be somehow, some way, some justice that would be brought against someone who has done what has just been done, Where is the justice going to come from if physically, when the shooter is dead, 
There's nothing more that can be done in this realm. But when you understand what the Scripture teaches, everybody who has ever lived is still alive somewhere. To conclude that that young man or anyone that we would pick out is no more than a June bug on a windshield. No more than a, than a raccoon in a bar ditch. No more than an armadillo all four feet up on the side of a road in such, that, such a way that when their hearts stopped beating, the animal ceased to exist. You and I are not animals in that sense. An armadillo hasn't been created in the image of God. When its heart stopped beating, it ceases to be, rot and decay sets in. But here's what Jesus is saying. They may put your body in the grave, but your soul still lives somewhere. So where is justice? If justice cannot be found here, just kill yourself. Be done with it. Take out all of these ones and then kill yourself. That's it. The enemy tells a lie like it's a truth. He can convince and, and work to do it in such a way that, that it, it, anything, anything is better than this. And so death, physical death comes and the conclusion is I'll quit hurting. I'll, I won't be guilty of what I just did because I won't exist. Oh, yes, you will. So let's go back to Revelation one more time. The book of the Revelation. I want you to find chapter 6. And again, the imagery of this vision to, to John um, is challenging to say the least. It, it can be perplexing as to what is meant by all of these things, but we accept it as the word of the Lord. And what, what we don't understand, we trust him with the understanding of and the explanation for. But look, look at this in, in chapter 6, verse 9. Seals on a book are being broken. The book of judgment. And when he broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar, now this is in heaven, in heaven, these ones he's about to talk about are in heaven, and they are underneath the altar, and it is, they are the souls of those who had been slain, killed, because of the Word of God, because of their standing on and believing in the Word of God, and because of the testimony which they had maintained, what they said they believed and how they lived. Verse 10, and they cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, wilt thou refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer and until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been should be completed also. In other words, there is the recognition of those who have been murdered unjustly and in this case specifically for their specifically martyred for their faith in Jesus and their commitment to his word, there, that there is a recognition in heaven for the need for justice to be served. It was not, the, 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 the context here is not that they were being just set aside and treated as, as their, their, what they're feeling and, and, and longing for as that not being a worthy motive. The saying, your motive is worthy. You have been unjustly put to death. Justice is coming. 
Just hold on. These are in heaven. Now, folks, that's, that's important. We're talking about how can there be healing and hope or hope and healing in a setting like this. i got to tell you, one of the places that is, that is hope for me is realizing that one day justice will be meted out. If it's not in this life, it's coming. And when we cry out, Lord, have mercy upon us, we are sinners and we recognize that. The ones, the ones in hell are the ones who have refused to repent. They have refused to acknowledge their sin and their wrong. And as a result of their rejection of Jesus and his forgiveness, hell is the place. That is what they have chosen. The Lord has not sent them there. They picked it. They chose it. They desired it as they rejected Jesus and his mercy. Even with that in place, from heaven, Ones who remember why they were put to death, saying to the Lord, how long will it be before you avenge our blood? Now that's something to hold on to. It's it's all in God's hands. But I'm telling you, whenever this, this thing rises up, well, it's just another shooting, it's just another whatever, as if those things we're supposed to get used to. Or as if when the the ones who have perpetrated the wrong, somehow they just got away with it. No. They still live somewhere. Columbine shooters still live somewhere. Every human who has ever lived still lives somewhere. Either in heaven or in a place of torment. Jesus used references to torment at least three or four times in that passage. Torment. If you're you're still in Revelation with me, I want you to find chapter 19 and verse 11. And I want to read down through this. It's it's a favorite passage. It's a... It's an amazing declaration of the day Jesus comes back to this earth. We hadn't seen the last of him. We may be in heaven and on one of these white horses coming back with him when he comes, or we could still be here when he shows up. But folks, when you read the descriptive terms about Jesus, the the Jesus who is coming, he's not coming as a gentle shepherd. He's coming as a warrior to avenge the wrongs that have been done against him and his cause and against his people. We can either know him now as the the God of mercy and grace or reject that and face one day Jesus the warrior who, who, who will come in opposition to ones who have rejected his plea to them for forgiveness and for mercy through faith in him. This is chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat upon it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, look, he judges and wages war. And his eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems or crowns, and he has a name written upon him which no one knows except himself. And he's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses, coming out of heaven with him. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress, notice this next phrase, he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings 
and Lord of Lords. Battle of Armageddon, that's a summary statement. The Lord shows up, defeats all the enemies. He's back on earth. Battle of Armageddon lasts in the blink of an eye. Verse 10, chapter 20, chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are also and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Pretty much all my ministry, I've been accused of being a fire and brimstone preacher. I just smile a little bit more now, not, not with glee of what would come to the ones who end up in that place, but the recognition that it does not matter who on the face of the earth, no matter how many PhDs they have, or how much money they have, or what what office of political power they have, and they disagree with what this book says. This book has outlasted, and the truth of it, everyone who has come to stand against it, they're buried. They would now say it's all true. There are no atheists in hell. They all believe now. They tried to convince, tried to, tried to, Satan the liar who can tell lies like the truth and being convinced, but, but, but on the other side, on the other side, folks, the truth is known. Jesus Christ is Lord and Satan is a defeated liar. So Jesus, the devil was, who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So a shooter who shoots, and innocent children are killed. Where is justice? To be absent from the body for a Christian is to be present with the Lord. To be absent from the body and not knowing Jesus is to find yourself in a devil's God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whoever, whoever would believe in him, Jesus, would not perish, perish, but have everlasting life. So there is a recognition in heaven that justice is to be served. Justice needs to be served. The ones who were wrongly killed, they're under the throne, they're martyred. When will we be remembered and those who did this to us be remembered? And the promise is coming. It's coming. So here, here's, let me, judgment day, judgment day. We hear that talked about. Where in the Bible does it talk about judgment day? Right, right here. Verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead. Now, this is a peculiar statement. I saw the dead. Well, if the dead, how can they see them? Because they're still living. The dead are still alive in spirit form, in soul form. I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Somewhere, at some point in time, even after ones have been consigned to hell because of the immediacy of leaving the physical body, the physical body can no longer hold them, but they are sent to the place where 
it's, it's filled with nothing but unbelief and anti-God and all things hating of God. But even that from there, at some point, they will be brought up to stand before the Lord and they will have to give an account for what they've done. You say, well, I, that, that seems kind of far off and out there. You know what? Jesus said in John chapter 16, it's to your advantage that I go away because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. My spirit will not come. But when the Spirit comes, He will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He will, con that he will convict the, the world of judgment because the prince of this world has been judged. In other words, yes, yes. It's possible for the Lord by His Spirit to scare the hell out of you by making it clear, hell is where I'm headed if there's no turn, if there's no turning to Jesus. There was a, one of the most famous sermons out of the First Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hand of a what? An angry God. Sinners, and, and it was said that such conviction would fall in most places where Jonathan Edwards would read it. He read the manuscript. He spoke monotone in a high, high kind of voice. And but they said that the conviction would so fall on the places where he would be doing that that grown men were white-knuckling the pew in front of them for fear that they were going to slip off and into the place of hell. That, 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 that's, that's where we don't want it to be. And so that from that place, we're able to say, it's in Jesus you find mercy. In Jesus you find forgiveness. In Jesus there is restoration and, and a resolution of the problem between me and God. He loves you. Don't keep fighting Him. He loves you. He wants to bless you. He wants to take you to heaven. Stop making it hard for Him, you know. But if we do, and if we resist, it's hell and not heaven. All right. An attempt at answering that question, where is justice? Where are the children? Where is justice? The third one, where are you then, Jesus? Where are you, Jesus, when these settings come and the innocent are being killed, brutalized, even being killed? Where, where, where are you? Where are you? One of the young deacons named Stephen, in the book of Acts, chapter 8, or 7, he, he was giving the testimony of Jesus, standing up for what he knew was true or right about Jesus, but there was such authority in what he spoke that the synagogue of the freedmen took such issue with him that they, they wanted to kill him. Now one day, this is verse 54, now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him, but being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and they rushed upon him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. Where was Jesus in the stoning of Stephen? Jesus was right there. He was right where Stephen was able to see him, to perceive him, to cry out to him. Jesus realizing that heaven is where he's going. It's going to be better in heaven than you staying down there, Stephen. I'm not going to protect you 
from this way that will be the conveyance of you getting from Jerusalem to glory. Well done, my son. Thank you for honoring me. Come on home. Come on home. There are no accidents. No death by accident. No, no somebody having something happen to them that just slipped up on the backside of the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul at the end of his life said, everyone forsook me. Everybody walked away. I don't hold it against them. But I've been here by myself facing death. He said, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me and enabled me to finish what he had put me here to do. The Lord stood with me. I'm talking to some folks now who would be able to say in my worst nightmare in the hardest of the heart when death came my way and it would seem as if the enemy would, was right that the, where's Jesus? He's left you, he's abandoned you right there in that place I felt his presence I sensed his love I, be, I began to be even more convinced that it's true, Romans 8 what can separate me from the love of God? or tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. Nothing has the power. Cut me off from the love of God which is mine in Christ Jesus. One of the great hymns that we've grown up singing is one that is called It Is Well with my soul. Horatio Spafford, a lawyer in the Chicago area in the 1870s, endured a major financial setback with the big Chicago fire in 1871. He was a friend and personal worker alongside Dwight L. Moody, the great evangelist who had his church in Chicago. They'd lost a four-year-old son, the only son, lost the four-year-old to, to a sickness, and the fire hit. Investments were burned up. And there was a sense that they just needed a break from the geography of the Chicago area to someplace different. Now, this is in the 1870s. So there were no jets flying the Atlantic or even steamships so he sent they were planning to go to England get away something business wise came up and it had to do with something of his with, with his property and the city from the fire so he had to stay and he sent his wife and four daughters 12 7 4 and 18 months. Sent them on ahead of him. After some days had passed, he gets a telegram from his wife saying, saved alone. Some point before they reached England, the ship that they were on collided with or their ship collided with another one and the ship that his wife and four daughters were on broke broke up and swiftly sank they found his wife holding on to a piece of wood from the broken part of the ship dazed barely alive all four daughters lost. Now here's a man who loves the Lord, is trying to serve the Lord, and this happens to him. Where are you, Jesus? Where are you, Jesus? He got on a boat and headed to England to meet his grieving wife. The captain of the ship that he was on knew something of the circumstance. 
and two or three days before they actually want to cross the spot or the closest that they could find the area where the ship went down and his daughters were killed he began to write these words the daddy who had lost his four daughters when peace when peace peace when peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well who's telling him it's well how does he know that in the middle of the road? It's the manifest presence of Jesus the King. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. One of the other verses that are not often put in hymn books today. For me, be it Christ, be it Christ hence to live. If Jordan above me shall roll, no pang shall be mine, for in death as in life thou wilt whisper thy peace to my soul. For me, but, but Lord, tis for thee, for thy coming we wait. The sky, not the grave, is our goal. O trump of the angel, O voice of the Lord, blessed hope, blessed rest for my soul. Where are you, Jesus? I am right where you are. I haven't forgotten you. I haven't left you. The devil hasn't stolen you from me. You belong to me. I am yours and you are mine. Heaven is home. Let me speak my peace to your soul. Lord, thank you for this time today. Even in the midst of great grief, at times it is felt during these last few days as if it is insurmountable grief. Lord, by your Spirit, you are reassuring us. You are restoring us to the place of being able to trust that there is nothing bigger than you. There is nothing stronger than you. And our trust is renewed to rest in you. Lord, we pray for those mamas and daddies and grandparents and cousins and uncles and aunts and siblings of ones who have lost loved ones in Uvalde. We pray, Lord, that by your Spirit, you'll just open many, many, many eyes and you'll flood them with the sense of your presence and your comfort. And that as was the case even in this situation, the background for the writing of one of the greatest hymns of the church, that somehow out of what has happened in Uvalde in lives, there will be amazing, stunning testimonies of how real you have come to be in those families' lives and how carefully they have felt your embrace and the warmth of your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to thank you for being here today in this room and our streaming family. This, this has been one of the most difficult weeks in my ministry life to realize what has happened on Tuesday and then to personally be grieving and weeping, hearing the stories and all, and then to know this Sunday was coming. But I believe if we look into this old book and we let the Spirit of the Lord apply those truths to our heart, hope and healing emerges by the power of his word applied to our hearts. Search the scriptures. 
For in them, Jesus said, you're going to find out more about me, about me. Stand with me, will you please? And streaming family, bless you for being a part of our family again today as you, you are every week. Pastor Walker at alamocity.org, if there's something we can pray with you about or a victory we can share with you in, let us hear from you, and we'd love to do that. Prayer partners, if you'll join me here at the front, and if you're here and you're needing, you're needing someone just to pray with you. We, we don't have all the answers, and we don't pretend to have all the answers, but we, we believe we have a connection with the one who does. And he in his mercy is able to refresh us and, and help us as we pray together. So let us do that with you. And oh my goodness, folks, if you've never settled that thing of whether you're going to heaven or hell, the difference between heaven and hell is faith in Jesus. It's just Jesus. It's not religion. It's not a denomination. It's not being baptized in a Jordan River. It's a personal relationship with Jesus, the Savior. Why is his name Savior? because he came to save us from hell. The place where when he is rejected, we end up when we don't have to. Amen. Okay, I better stop. Let you guys go get something to eat. God bless you. And let's keep praying for Uvalde and our area. We'll let you know if there's some things from churches there that we can do to help with them during this time. God bless you. Come this way if we can pray for you and with you. Thank you. Thank you for coming.